welcome to episode 104 of the Hunt Back Country podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. You know, something we say a lot on this show is that we love to hear from you guys, our listeners, and that's true. We love getting your emails, your seeing your reviews, and all of that. We love hearing your stories, most of all. And in tonight's episode, we actually have a story from one of you guys, our listeners. Stephen Wolf is our guest, and... This story is not just about a hunt, it's about a lot more. You see, Stephen went out on a hunt, just a small hunt, relatively close to home, although still somewhat in the backcountry, and before he knew it, Stephen found himself down and injured. And this story ends with a helicopter ride, getting rescued off the mountain. It's one of those stories where it's like, yeah, it was so simple and it happened so fast, but, you know, it could never happen to me, right? I mean, Stephen thought the same thing. I think the same thing, but there's so many lessons in this story for me and you to hear and to maybe make some changes for our future endeavors, no matter whether they're close to home or in the deepest of backcountry. The fact is when you go out in the mountains, especially if you're going out solo, you kind of can't be too safe. So I hope that this story is not only entertaining to hear about kind of on the adventure level, but that it's also helpful and that maybe makes you rethink some of your plans and how you go out on your adventures into the backcountry. Before we get into that story, just wanted to say thank you to you guys for your participation in the big giveaway that we did in the month of November to celebrate our 100th episode. Again, this was really to say thank you to you guys. We were thrilled to give away an X amount gear pack and dozens of other prizes from our friends and other companies that we work with. So again, just thank you. Thank you for your participation, for your feedback. Again, as always, you can contact us by email to podcasts at exomontgear.com. We also really appreciate your reviews in iTunes. That helps us a great deal or wherever else you might be listening to this. Okay, let's get on to this show. Our guest, our listener, Stephen Wolf, and his story of a hunt and a rescue. Steve, welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast. How are you? I'm uh, doing well. Thanks for having me, Mark. Awesome. And Steve Speck, you're on the line. You're going to be Speck tonight because we got two Steves going. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair. <laughs> I could pick another nickname for you, but I'll be nice. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> well, um, well, Steve, uh, glad to have you on the show. Um, I'm excited to get this one out there for sure. Before we get into your story, let's start with just a little bit about you for context for listeners. Um here we are coming off of, uh, as the time of the recording this anyway, we're coming off of Veterans Day weekend, and I know that you're a veteran, so we certainly thank you for that and sincerely do appreciate it. Um, but yeah, go ahead and give us some personal background. Anytime that you want to discuss your service or any other aspects you feel would be uh, relevant, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, sure. So I uh, was born and raised in Spokane, Washington here. Uh, grew up uh, hunting since I was very young, uh, mostly started out on birds uh, at a young age, I think about 10, and uh, largely pheasants and grouse and stuff like that. Just grew up spending a lot of time in the woods. Uh, so, of course, did uh, three sports in high school and, and all that kind of stuff. And I graduated the year that uh, our, uh, our country was attacked, and that uh, kind of changed the trajectory of my life in a big way. Um, about a Two years after high school, I decided uh, that um, I wasn't satisfied with the jobs I was working and wanted a bit more. So I uh, joined the United States Army and I was able to secure a uh, ranger contract. And what that meant was I had a guaranteed opportunity to try out for the 75th Ranger Regiment and go through their selection process as long as I, of course, graduated basic training and airborne school and those things. Um, So I was successful in that endeavor. um, And... Uh, 2004 through 2008, I served uh, with 1st Ranger Battalion at a Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, Georgia. Made uh, four tours overseas, three to Afghanistan, one to Iraq. I served primarily as a uh, shooter on a two-man sniper team there. Uh, it was a fantastic period of my life. Of course, uh, combat has its challenges, but uh, met some of the best people I've uh, ever known. Um, after the military service, I, um, went to fire school and, uh, EMT school and fast forward just a little bit. I became a firefighter paramedic here in, uh, Spokane Valley where I'm a, a professional these days. And that's, uh, 
what I'm doing for a living along with uh, as much hunting as I can possibly get in uh, each year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I saw you mention you get how many days, a year, well, on a normal year, not this year, but <laughs> how many days a year do you try and uh, get out in the fall and through that season? You know, September through December, I will I will try to spend somewhere between 40 and 60 days in the field. Yeah. Holy cow. That's, That's awesome. awesome. He's giving you a run for your money, Steve. <laughs> yeah. I only got 25 days this year. You got me trumped by far. Yeah, only 25 in September out of 30. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Do you happen to know Ryan Kleckner, Steve? Uh, I know of him. Oh, um, okay. I, and uh, I know that he served in uh, first battalion in the uh, the same section that I did uh, prior to my service. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I knew the age gap was a little bit, but I figured being uh, both in the sniper area of the first battalion, I didn't know if you crossed paths at all. That's interesting. Yeah, unfortunately, not uh, not him specifically, but you know, it's a small community uh, the snipers. So, yeah, yeah I can imagine. Mm. Awesome. So we want to get uh, to, to get right into the story that happened with you this fall, uh, this past September, uh, an unfortunate story, but one that um, we can all learn from. So kind of before we get into the event, kind of just lead us into how your fall was going in September. I mean, a lot of time in the field. Um, so before this event that we're going to sp- talk about tonight, uh, any other stories from your fall before then? Oh, sure. Well, um, interestingly enough, I hunted this, uh, the same mountain I was on, I hunted on uh, September 1st, which is the opening day of most of our fall seasons here in Washington, um, and just took it easy. We, you know, I trained all spring. I completed a half marathon training plan in the spring, and then uh, transferred that into, um, of course, plenty of uh, walking with backpacks and weights and um, that sort of thing, and mountain biking and the whole bit, and of course, plenty of scouting trips through the summer for elk. So uh, typically we try to not hunt as much through the Labor Day weekend just because, uh, you know, it's so busy. So many folks have time off work. So um, I just did a did a quick grouse hunt that day. And then um, a few days later, we took off to uh, central Idaho for an elk hunt. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of backcountry hunting, of course, how we got into listening to podcasts and whatnot. And um, we uh, we went in on September, the evening of September 5th, uh, the next morning. We uh, woke up and camped there and decided we'd that we'd glass. And, of course, I'm sure you guys know hunting central Idaho this year. It was very, very smoky and um, difficult conditions early on there. Um, but we did manage to hear a couple of bulls bugle way down the drainage from us. And, and, of course, you know, that early they weren't too terrible fired up. But we decided, ah, you know, well, my partner and I decided we'd get down in there a ways and, uh, and see what we could make happen. So uh, worked our way down in the drainage, took, you know, the better part of the day and uh, – as we sat down there about three in the afternoon, we'd intermittently hear a couple of different bulls bugling and kind of try to start moving in and, and working our way to them as best we could. And, you know, they just weren't real vocal to start with. And about four in the afternoon, they got uh, these two bulls were on opposite sides, south and north sides of this particular drainage. And man, they got each other uh, just going like crazy. So uh, we decided just by happenstance to go after uh, the bull on the north side and uh, made our way up there, got a good location on him. We were able to close to oh, about 75 yards from his location and uh, ran a challenge sequence, just uh, you know, cut him off on a, on a bugle and raked tree a couple of times and rolled a couple rocks down the hill. And lo and behold, he came in uh, to my buddy at about 10 yards and he was able to make a fantastic shot on him and we were able to sit there and watch him fall and got up to him to find out that we'd killed our, our first backcountry bull as a as a party and he was scored about three hundred and twenty inches. So it was wow. a yeah, first bull, first stock oh. got right after it this year. <laughs> that's a stud bull out of central Idaho. Hey, yeah, central Idaho, that's a that's a stud. <laughs> yeah, that's a beast. Yeah. Yeah, we were super excited. Yeah. We'd have, we'd have shot anything, you know. We've we've only killed a couple of elk between all of us. You know, it was just kind of one of those deals that uh Right place, right time. I mean, I'd love to love to say that we're just awesome at it, or we passed on ten bulls, but that wasn't the case. It just uh, just worked out for us really well. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. That's for sure. Um, yeah, let's. I want to maybe come back to that hunt because I think there's some other lessons and stories we can get to. But let's fast forward then into September, getting back from Idaho, and I'm I'm sure there's some other events in there we could dissect in the weeks beforehand. But take us straight to now 
getting back home in Washington into September, you go out on a bird hunt and how's it going? What happens? <laughs> All right. So yeah, just, I went on a little de- uh, decompression hunt as I would call it. Um, still had some more time off work and, uh, got back after, uh, the, the season got pretty tough after that for us. Um, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to grab my dog. I'm going to go up and just do a little grouse hunting. This was supposed to just be, you know, a little day hunt, no big deal. Um, going to watch the football game, take the girlfriend out for date night, that kind of thing in the evening. Um, but you know, where a lot of the places I hunt in, in retrospect are, um, relatively remote. So yeah, I, would uh, just decided, you know, I'm going to hit the high country, see if I can't find some blue grouse. And, and usually that goes out pretty well. Like take my antique 16 gauge shotgun out just for nostalgia's sake and, and uh, it was a gorgeous day, man. It was about, uh, I think the high was just under 70 degrees. Um, you know, we had a little forecast of a front moving in the next couple of days, but it wasn't supposed to be any too big a deal. Um, just kind of grabbed my backpack, some water and the dog and said, hey, we're going to take off and, and go get after this thing. And everything was going fantastic that day. Um, my my dog was working fantastic. I had killed uh, killed a couple of birds and was working, working for a limit, but primarily just really enjoying the day and enjoying the high country with just, uh, myself and, and my fantastic bird dog. And well, we, uh, we got to the end of the ridge where I typically turn around up there and, um, he got really, really hot on a bird. And I knew by his body language and all that, that he was working hard in the cover and something was about to happen. And uh, I could kind of, you know, I've hunted birds, like I said, a lot of my life. So I had a pretty good idea of where these, where this bird was going to flush. So I needed to, to move downhill. And as the dog was working hard, I knew I needed to move quickly. So I started to run a little bit down a relatively gentle grade for where I was at. I was in some pretty steep country, but this particular spot wasn't, uh, wasn't too terrible steep. So as I started to run downhill just a little bit, trying to adjust, uh, dog flushed the birds, I stopped to shoot. And next thing I knew I was on, uh, on my butt and, uh, wasn't really sure what had happened if I'd stepped in a hole or what have you, but I knew my knee hurt, you know, terribly and was trying to gather my senses and this and that and figure out what was going on. I looked down and realized at the very least I dislocated my kneecap. Um, my, my knee was clear up into my thigh and of course I'm in, you know, extreme amounts of pain and, and unable to move. So at that point, I realized I was in trouble. Um, that was probably the um, the most scared I can say I've, I've ever been for uh, all the different things I've seen, all the, the things I've done. Uh, by far, those moments between realizing I was down in the back country and not knowing for sure um, if I was going to be able to get any cell phone service or exactly how that was going to pan out. Yeah. So and, are you uh, immediately, I mean you knew immediately that you were pretty much immobile and not getting out of there on your own power or how were you sort of assessing the injury? Yeah. yeah, Basically, as soon as I looked down, I knew, um, I knew that I wasn't going to be walking anywhere or, or, um, going to be able to get out in in, with any kind of ease under my own power. Uh, and I, I, like I said, I've hunted this particular area quite a few times. So I knew I should have cell phone service, um, but yeah, I, I immediately knew that, uh, that I was in going to be in trouble if I had to get out or try to get out on my own and to get out like how, mileage, what were you from the truck? Was it elevation? I mean, what's kind of the conditions of that? Yeah. So according to Google earth, um, just the walking distance, uh, about three and a half miles from my pickup truck, um, almost uh, a little over 2000 feet elevation gain. I was at 6,200 feet, um, exactly where I fell. Uh, so yeah, quite, quite a ways. And again, very, very rough terrain. The majority of this ridgeline and mountain is uh, very, very steep, um, relatively open South face. So not a, not a ton of trees and things to deal with in that regard, but, um, judging, you know, where I was at, I had some exceedingly difficult and technical ground to, to try to cross back over. Yeah. So you, are you formulating a plan ABC or kind of what's the next steps on evaluating the situation? So, um, right then and there, first thing I want to know is, you know, who can I get a hold of, right? What, um, I, I wanted to, um, get my, my cell phone out as quick as I could. Cause that's, that's the first lifeline, right? If I can get a hold of people, get them coming to me, I know that's going to be the best situation. So, uh, did get my pack off, flip the phone on and, uh, lo and behold, I had uh, cell phone service. Thank God. So first call I made actually wasn't 911. Um, maybe a little bit of denial there still at that point, but I actually called my dad 
and uh, let him know because he knows the area relatively well. Um, and so got, got him moving in that direction. And I called my, uh, my good buddy, Mike, who I hunt with, who's actually the, the guy that arrowed the bull down there in Idaho. Um, he was home as well. And apparently he was in the, in the gym at the time. And of course, on this day, he's, uh, doing a nice hefty leg workout, <laughs> um, not knowing what's about to transpire. So I, uh, I couldn't get a hold of him. I shot him a text said, Hey man, I'm having an emergency. I need you to get a hold of me. So he calls me back, says, okay, well, what'd you kill? I said, well, um, <laughs> he's thinking, he's thinking I shot a bear or something, you know, back in there and I, I need help with it. And of course that wasn't the case. I said, no man, I've, uh, I've dislocated my knee. I need you to come get me. And he knew right where I was at. I didn't, uh, didn't have my GPS with me, so I could not give him GPS coordinates, but he got the message and said, all right, I'm, I'm on my way. So was this, uh, was, sorry to keep interrupting. I'm just thinking of things that might be helpful. Was this an established trail that you could have run into like a hiker or another hunter is it heavily trafficked or you know great question mark uh it, it is not heavily trafficked so there is a um a, a forest service trail that runs out the majority of this this ridge line however it's unmaintained these days so you can still find it on old maps right. um, but you're not going to find on anything new they they've abandoned the trail and you know some of us have kind of kept it open and in fact the the way that I get to the trail isn't um, isn't even on the map. I use a, a spur ridge to get up up to the trail to cut off some distance. Um, so that's uh, n- the answer is kind of simply no. You'll run into some other hunters from time to time uh, that are that are out there, but um, at this particular time frame in Washington, none of the big game seasons were yet open. Uh, the the next morning, the muzzleloader elk season was going to open in that unit, so there's a possibility that someone might have, you know, been working their way out there. But um, tough to tell on that. Yeah. Okay. So you call Dad. You get Mike. Uh, continue to walk us through it. I didn't mean to interrupt you and cut you off. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's all good. So uh, yeah. So then, of course, now I need to, you know, not notify the authorities, and uh, so I I call nine one one. And, you know, of course, they asked me what their emergency is and where I'm at. And this is where things get a little interesting. Um, with not having a GPS with me, I know where I'm at. Um, but I also didn't bring my map with me because I know this area. And I'm not going to leave the ridgeline. I'm not going to chase an elk, what have you. You know, I'm just I'm just bird hunting, right? So that's kind of where the first moment of aha, some some uh, complacency has, has set into what it is I'm doing. Um Lucky for me, they were able to uh, GPS locate off of my phone. So I'm trying to explain to the guy where I'm at in the nearest road. He's like, well, where's the nearest road to you? Well, yeah, that's great, man. But that's like, you know, 2,000 feet elevation gain and three and a half miles off the wrong direction. You know, it's not the nearest road isn't necessarily the way, the best way to get to me. And once again, I know that. But trying to communicate that to someone uh, over the phone who has no idea about the area got, got really interesting real quick. Yeah. So with that GPS location, though, um, he was able to start describing some things to confirm it and like, okay, we got this kind of got this figured out. So they, you know, notify everybody and um, then the big wait starts. And about this time, I realized, you know, cell phone batteries not doing so hot. So um, time to start turning the phone off. So So I've got my dad coming. Was there a plan of, from the authorities, like with talking to 911, you said they got people coming. Did Were you clear on what the plan of action was from here in terms of a rescue? No, not as far as the specifics of it. And see, th- these are some of the interesting parts is doing what I do for a living. Um, I have a pretty good understanding of, of what the steps are, right? We, um, even as the fire department in the municipality that I work for have conducted uh, relatively small search and rescue operations. We have, we do have a couple of relatively large tracts of land, you know, a few hundred acres, that kind of thing that people have been lost in before. Um, but you know, it's all about time at this point. Um, and, and that's something that no is not well communicated as far as exactly, you know, what they're sending, who they're sending, um, you know, and kind of any sort of anticipated estimated time of arrival. Um, they just kind of tell you helps on the way and, you know, stay put, don't eat anything. They give you some very basic advice and, and just tell you, they're going to get people to you. Um, in that particular instance where they actually have a, a GPS location certainly helps them out as far as, you know, they know exactly, um, where it is they need to send folks to. Um, interestingly enough, I told them cause I, again, with my professional background and, and, um, all the different things that I have been through and, and done and, 
I knew immediately that they were not going to get me off this mountain without a helicopter. And I tried, uh, I tried to communicate that to dispatch, but you see, here's the thing. They don't, um, they're not going to, uh, spin resources like that at the victim's request. They need some official on ground to assess that situation and decide what's actually necessary. You know, plenty of, plenty of folks will get, uh, you know, all kinds of up in arms or, or just be flat out scared and, Oh, I need this and that. And, you know, just, I want off the mountain, which of course, you know, in that particular situation you do. Uh, but in my case, it ended up being necessary. So let's see, that was about, I, I went down at about one thirty in the afternoons when I started making phone calls, uh, it took them about three hours to get to me. Uh, the first, first guys there were actually border patrol agents. Uh, that was that close to the Canadian border that, uh, apparently they were the closest ones to, uh, to be able to get to me. So they arrived at about, uh, four thirty in the afternoon. And of course that's when things really kind of started to move along as far as, um, what kind of plans they had and, and what they were going to be able to do, um, what resources were and were not available. So, um, at that time they said they were trying to call for a air force helicopter. There's not that far away as the crow flies from where I was. There's uh, an air force survival school. They operate up in that particular area and they have a Huey that they have hoist capability with. We're trying to get a hold of that. And they said, yeah, it's going to be two thirty in the morning. Um, so they tried to bring a, uh, a very small life flight helicopter out of Spokane for me. They got up there, got on scene, were unable to land. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Sitting up there just hoping, you know, they were going to be able to land somewhere somewhat nearby. And these guys would be able to carry me over to the, the helicopter. And that ended up not working out. So they called for um, a relatively new resource up in this particular area. But they're called uh, Two Bear Air out of Kalispell, Montana. Um, and I think there's probably a good little time to tell their story just a little bit. So, um, a gentleman named, uh, Michael Godwin provides, uh, provides all the funding for, uh, two bear air. So it's all, uh, all out of his pocket. He's a very wealthy individual. I'm not exactly sure how he made his money. Mostly venture capitalist is my understanding from what I've been able to find through Google. Uh, but he pays for everything up there and, um, they fly a free service. Um, it's all complimentary. They, uh, apparently they go into Washington now on their website. They just say, uh, basically Idaho and Montana. Do they make, um, Deliveries or just rescues? <laughs> as far as I know, just just rescues at the moment. Like I'm just, you know, we get on day five and like, man, a cold beer would be great right now. Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So yeah, they got up there at about um, it was about eight thirty in the evening, and uh, they they were able to to um, put a couple of guys down on down on the ground. And of course, I'd been, you know, I'm like seven hours into this thing with what turned out to be a completely separated patella tendon, uh, been an immense amount of pain throughout that entire time. Had you had eight at this point from any of the first responders on the ground? So yeah, they, uh, they showed up, but they were all what are called wilderness EMT. So they don't carry any narcotics, uh, no ability to start IVs or anything like that. Basically they're, they're there to treat hypothermia and ideally, um, help package you or move you to a you know more advantageous location, depending on injuries and things like that. So their capabilities are limited in that regard. Um, so two bear air on the other hand does have a, a paramedic on, on their helicopter, which they can uh, start IVs. They can do uh, some of that advanced life support and also carry an array of um, narcotics, which help with uh, pain management. Of course, uh, when they got, uh, got those guys there, I was able to kind of tell them my background, let them know, Hey, look, I've you know, been under helicopters before. We're not going to have any issues there. Uh, but what I need you to do is give me some pain relief so we can support this thing and get me out of here. And so that they did, uh, they were fantastic. They worked, uh, worked with me based on my professional background, actually let me do some of my own bandaging of and supporting of my injury. Uh, so I was able to be, um, unusually involved in that particular aspect of the process. And, um, so from there, it kind of, the, the story gets a little bit, um, less interesting in that they were just able to, uh, get me into the harness and whatnot. And then, Hoisted me off the mountain. However, at this point, I'm under the uh, influence of ketamine, which is a uh, kind of interesting drug. It's called a dissociative drug. So what was interesting about this is I knew my knee hurt, and of course, I knew a lot of what was going on. However, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. Like I'm, I'm seeing these things happen, and I'm seeing myself being in pain uh, and being hoisted off the mountain after dark. And it was uh, kind of surreal, to be honest with you. Uh, but from that point, they were they were able to 
take uh, take me on down to uh, I own Washington where there's a little airfield there. Transfer me over to um, Life Flight out of Spokane. Flew me into the hospital and um, there I had to wait a couple of days for surgery, but um, they were able to patch me up and and uh, kind of get get the ship righted at that point. Uh, and then the recovery process began. Wow. So that two bear air. There's no, I mean, no cost, no charge at all. It's completely covered by that individual. Yep, uh, completely, completely covered by that uh, Mr. Goggin. He um, he pays for all of their operating expenses, all the salaries for the employees, pays for all the helicopters, everything. So yeah, no, there was absolutely no expense to me as as the user. Um, they've flown uh, several different missions, which you can look up on their website. Um, each each year they fly quite a few, but yeah, it's a. Uh, a very cool deal. Usually those helicopter rides are exceedingly expensive, um, especially if you're not well insured for them. So, Yeah, I mean, that's a point I wanted to bring up, and I, I don't know much about it, but I've seen that there's been, um, you know, offerings of, like, rescue insurance, and I've heard of, um, you know, reading articles or what have you of costs, and it can, I mean, get ten grand plus, depending on the scale of the rescue, obviously. Um, so that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a number of different uh, different services out there that uh, guys can look into. I, I definitely highly recommend it. You know, after my my situation of um, you know not only okay, there's a lot of things after the fact. Once you once you're back to safety and and you know everything's going going well in that regard, then you start talking pretty quickly about what you know what are the financial impacts going to be um, of a situation like that long term, which for a lot of folks can be devastating. I mean, I'm going to be out of work for six to nine months. Uh, while I recover, um, un- unable to do my job, um, if I, you know, worked at a computer for a living, that might be a little different, but, uh, you know, there's lucky for me, I'm, I'm well insured and, and I have a, a great job that I'm able to, uh, to mitigate a lot of that, but there's, you know, these, uh, the impacts of this sort of backcountry um, emergency like this can be, can be far reaching beyond, I think what most people would stop and think about, certainly beyond what I stopped and thought about. Uh, before heading out that day or or many other in years past yeah i mean this uh so much to talk about here so this this went i mean i don't want to downplay at all what happened to you i obviously didn't go through it and i think it would be uh, a wild experience and certainly something we don't wish on anybody at the same time in terms of going down in the backcountry being alone there's a lot of things that went quote-unquote well in your story um, in terms of having self-service, in terms of being able to get someone to you within a matter of a few hours. I mean, things could have been much, much worse, and thankfully they weren't. But let's let's kind of think through some of those things, and then I would just love, I'm sure you've at least thought about it, to get some perspective on if things didn't go well. Like, how 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 do you think about it now, I guess we should say? So in terms of, do you see yourself... Um, relying more on some type of other device beyond cell service um have you assessed for your situation if you would have had to stay the night out there even though it was a quote-unquote quick hunt or plan to be one have you sort of reevaluated what you carry in terms of essentials that you're always going to have with you no matter what kind of those things um i'd just love to hear any thoughts or um yeah any any information that you've processed since this event Oh, absolutely. I've had uh, had a, a lot of time to sit down and, and think about it, and and really have. Um, and there's there's some other aspects of this I'd like to um, to get into, kind of toward the end. Uh, that's also happened in my family just ten days after my event. Um, that being said, so I do typically carry uh, an emergency kit um, when I go anytime I go into the back country. Um, and I think that's the first step here is not just what you carry, but how you plan and think about and how you assess where it is that you go. I've hunted this particular drainage since I was probably seven years old and I got complacent because I go there all the time. And the reality of how remote it actually is, it's this, this area I I can be hunting in it from 45 minutes from my house. 
Um, that's, that's how intimate it is for me. That being said, there's a whole bunch of areas that don't have cell phone coverage. In fact, if I had just been a little bit lower in the drainage, even as much as a few hundred yards, but certainly a half mile or more, I would have had no cell phone service. Um, this injury was not predicated on being at elevation. There was no fall involved. It was a athletic type injury that could have happened basically anywhere. Um, it's kind of a wonder it didn't happen while we were uh, packing my buddy's elk out, to be honest with you. So I think that's kind of where things start is really being honest with your with yourself about you know how how remote the area is and even if it isn't considered that remote you know how far do you plan on getting away from your vehicle um you know it's one thing i i lived out in ohio for a little while after my military service and you know walking a couple hundred yards to a deer stand from a from your pickup truck you know there's not a lot of chances for things to happen there um however out here there's a lot of places that we go that that um, this sort of thing could have been just as devastating. In fact, could have ended up worse. So because I didn't really ever consider it as a backcountry area because it's it's pretty heavily roaded. However, when you go down and are unable to walk and are maybe looking at crawling, um, looking at having to uh, to try to brace your own injuries – deal with the pain. Um, that was another thing that was immensely surprising to me is the amount of pain I was in just very minute movements. I can't imagine what, it, what I would have had to endure to try to, to try to crawl out of where I was. So, um, but as far as exactly, you know, what, what a guy, you know, should carry or what I've taken stock of, um, I didn't have my kit with me. Um, I had a headlamp and I had one extra layer, um, in my backpack, uh, enough water and, and food for the day uh, for my dog and myself. That was that was it, and that was just grossly underprepared for where I was uh, staying the night. I, I don't know if I'd have made it. Um, like I said, a front was coming in, um, and they uh, forecast snow at that elevation that evening. So we were going to go from almost a seventy degree high to freezing overnight with definite moisture in the high country, and as you know, most of us are aware that that go back in those areas, that kind of thing is um, can happen very very quickly. Um, and as far as what I you know what I do carry, typically um, I've got you know a couple of trauma dressings, um, I've got you know some tape, light, lighter fire starter that sort of thing, some you know mild over the counter pain relievers like Tylenol. Of course, I've always got a headlamp on me. Usually, in any kind of backcountry hunt, I've always got a head or a multi-tool, a couple of uh, you know, pocket knives, that sort of thing, and of course, extra layers, an emergency blanket, and then in my case, I actually typically carry a bee sting kit as well, as I'm allergic to bees, which I did not have with me that day, um, and of course, some iodine tablets uh, and some sort of signaling device like a whistle or mirror. Um, all of that was um, sitting in my quote-unquote backcountry pack, which was sitting at home on this particular event. So I was feeling um, pretty stupid at that particular time, to be honest with you. And I do not own at this time um, any kind of an emergency beacon or cell phone or satellite communicator, that sort of thing. Um, Was always just kind of, hey, I do it with a map and compass. You know, we'll be we'll be okay, Right. Typically go with other folks. Uh, those days I can tell you're definitively over Um, talking, talking over with my buddies, just knowing the amount of time it takes for, uh, for people to get to you, even if they know the location. Um, I can't imagine what it would have been like, um, if people had been just literally trying to search to find me to begin with how much longer that could have taken. I mean, that's another point to bring up as well. Had you communicated your plan or any sort of deadline with anyone? So, you know, Mark, I had, I, I always do. However, um, what I, what I would say is interesting about this is I do communicate my plan and I do, I do try to tell, uh, tell at least somebody where I'm at. That being said, um, I, I told my, my girlfriend where I was going, who I love to death. However, in hindsight, her ability, had I not come home that night, had I not had cell phone service, her ability to communicate to the authorities in an articulate way, you know, exactly where I was, um, I, and, and she commented after that she probably wouldn't have done a very good job. And, and that's, that's probably very realistic. And the reason being is I don't just kind of, oh yeah, hey, I'm, I'm heading up to this mountain. Well, that's a, a broad area, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, 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 mm-hmm. it can cover miles unless you're literally just sitting on top of it, 
which often, you know, when things happen, isn't going to be the case. So she didn't have a map or anything with a, you know, like a route drawn on or, you know, some sort of a Google Earth overlay with that sort of thing. Nothing that could have been shown to someone that understood because she doesn't know how to read maps. She doesn't go into the back country, though that's just not in, um, you know, in one of her um, hobbies or anything like that. So that would have been a difficult thing for her to do under those circumstances to really communicate the plan. And so that was something I've taken stock of after is who, who am I communicating the plan to? And, um, you know, how, how do they understand where it is I'm going and are they going to be able to communicate that to the, to the proper folks that are going to need it should something like this occur? Yeah. Yeah. That's always an interesting point. I mean, even with, with my wife, most of the time I'm giving her information that she doesn't understand um, and I'll literally tell her, you don't need to understand this, but show this to somebody like, you know what I mean? Cause the authorities will know what to do with the information basically, but obviously you can't just do that verbally. Right. Um, and so I think it's important to not only tell someone where you're going, but unless they have very intimate knowledge and can pinpoint the authorities and literally take them to your location, I think it's very wise to document, um, write it down, send an email to that person that can pass it on something, um, that would be valuable information to the authorities, if not for that person. Absolutely. I absolutely agree, Mark. That's, um, uh, a key point moving forward, you know, it's very different. I, I, uh, went out scouting this summer by myself, uh, down in the salmon river country, which I'm sure you guys are aware of is, is pretty nasty, pretty brutal country. And of course, not a lot of cell phone coverage mm-hmm. down there. And uh, I was able to communicate uh, with my with my good buddy, uh, and, and of course he knew very very well. Hey, I'm going to use this trail. I'm going from here to here. You're going to use this ridge line, and I very intently stuck to that that path, and, and did not have any any problems under that circumstance. But man, I was looking back over that and thinking, okay, that that could have been interesting. My, my route, you know, some of us. I'm sure you guys do. Some of these routes go anywhere from three to 10 plus miles. That's an enormous amount of country for, for search and rescue folks to cover when they don't, uh, don't have a pinpoint location on you. I was, I was ask, just with your experience, um, going back to your emergency kit, I would love to get like the top 10 items that you think everybody should have in their pack. Um, I think that'd be a great information for everybody. Cause for me, it's really basic. It's band-aids and, aspirin and iodine tablets and duct tape. I think that's, <laughs> that's what makes up my first aid kit. Well, yeah, absolutely. Mark or uh, Steve, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go over that. And I tell you the number one thing that will be in, in my pack and, um, and all of my partner's packs from here on out is either some sort of a Garmin in reach or at the very least a spot GPS mm-hmm. locator. Fact of the matter is if you get an injury bad enough, you can't carry enough uh, things. And that, that was true of our, you know, combat medics, overseas, you know, mm-hmm. guy gets shot up bad enough or there's enough uh, bleeding and this and that. The only thing that can save you under certain circumstances in a certain period of time is getting to definitive care or that being a surgeon, a doctor, whatever for them to do their things. So um, my kid is relatively basic too, but um, so we start out with having a way to communicate and get, get help coming because um, uh, depending on the situation, my particular injury um, I could have, I could have lived with it out there a long time. Not, you know, not every injury is that way, depending on the elements and, and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So the one thing I would suggest that everybody, um, get a hold of is called an Israeli bandage. You can Google it. Um, we had them in, in the Ranger Battalion. Um, we're actually starting to carry them down the fire service. A lot of that military stuff is trickling over into the, what we, you know, there called the civilian side. And what an Israeli bandage is and what it's able to do is it's essentially a large ACE wrap. Um, they don't weigh very much. They're not particularly bulky, but they do have a trauma pad in there and they're, they're good for a number of different things. This, this bandage can be used, um, to, to put compression on any kind of a penetrating injury or any kind of bleeding and actually act as, a. Uh, it won't it won't completely act like a tourniquet, but it will act like a very good con- compression dressing. Can be uh, cinched down very tight, um, and by the nature of the fact that it's an ace wrap, it can also be used to um, you know run um, help secure splinting material along a fracture that sort of thing, um, and can be used for mm-hmm. a number of different different applications. Um, in fact, in my particular situation, what we ended up doing was uh, my my knee was actually in a ninety degree 
um, orientation, and I was unable to straighten it due to the fact that the tendon was completely ruptured. So we actually used an Israeli dressing that uh, that the medic had from the uh, helicopter, and we just ran it around my uh, completely around my leg to brace it in place for when they hoisted me off the mountain because they didn't uh, they didn't have a way to put me in a litter or anything to put me on like a flat bore. They actually had to just hoist me up with a harness. So um, that dressing in and of itself is my number one recommendation. Um, you know, we all carry band-aids and things like that, but you know, heck a little bit of duct tape and this and that can, can take care of those uh, small injuries mm-hmm. that way. So uh, definitely one of those, certainly something to uh, start and maintain a fire. And, you know, we all love an average Bic lighter, but I definitely suggest at least a handful, which I always carry of, um, well, always except for this particular time, uh, some stormproof matches, <laughs> that sort of thing, because we all know the uh, how uh, conditions never seem to line up and be conducive to what it is you're trying to do. Um, and certainly yeah. have an extra headlamp, you know, that's, um, that's absolutely key. And then, um, making sure you have the right layers, um, extra things. It's, you know, it it gets said so many times, but it's so true. Just having a lightweight pair of gloves and a beanie hat, um, even as warm as it was that day. Of course, I didn't take anything that like that with me because I'm not going to need it. Right. Well, believe me, I was wishing I had it when the sun went down and the wind kicked up, up at that elevation. Um, and it's certainly those little emergency blankets, um, you know, that's the first time I've ever had one around me. Uh, that's that's what uh, the first responders brought up. And it was amazing, the difference in heat. And we were able to um, kind of string a couple up when they got a fire started around me and all that and to get it uh, reflecting some heat back on me. So I definitely recommend carrying uh, at least a couple of those. And then um, some iodine tablets, too. You know, if I'd have been, been out there for any length of time. Um, didn't necessarily need to carry a filtration system or anything like that, but you know, water is a huge thing. We can go a long time as most of us know without food and without a lot of things. But, uh, you know, if I'd had to crawl off that mountain, water would have be, would have become an issue at some point. Okay. Uh, that's great. Great tips. Yeah. Just an en- envisioning too. I mean, this is some things I carry that I also look at and I'm like, really, could you ever use this? But a signaling becomes really important in a situation like this. As you mentioned, if, if you have someone trying to locate you and don't and they don't have a pinpoint location, um, you know something like a whistle, something like uh, some sort of light beacon, even a mirror for reflection, some sort of signaling um, could prove incredibly valuable. Valuable for sure. Absolutely. Are there other lessons um, that we haven't asked about, or bits of information, Steve, from your experience that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. So there's a few things that, you know, this kind of has spurred me into uh, trying to do some research on it. And I, I've uncovered some interesting things. Uh, one of the interesting, most interesting things is that the no government agency the, that I'm able to, um, to track down, there is no definitive database for how many people go missing in the in the wilderness, how many people are rescued. Uh, but there's a small amount of information available that's getting somewhat dated based on the national park system and how often they go after lost hikers and so on and so forth. And there's some demographic information there, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot more people go missing on our public lands uh, than, than you'd realize. And so some of the circumstances that, that surround that I think are, are worth bringing up. And, and definitely a, a lot of these things were, um, were things that, um, befell me. So, you know, first of all, just the, the age groups. All right. So the most likely age groups to, to need or activate a search and rescue event are men between the ages of 20 and 25. And then there's kind of a big jump to 50 and 60. So you're going to have a lot of those younger guys getting lost or otherwise hurt. And then, um, a lot of illness going on with that 50 to 60 range, a lot of heart attacks, that sort of thing. Um, strokes even happening, you know, in, in, uh, the wrong kinds of situations. Um, so most of these inst- instances will occur on what we are, what are termed as short distance or otherwise known as day hikes. So a lot of the information you'll come across has to do with hikers, um, not hunting specific, but it, once again, it's that short trip. Uh, folks go unprepared like myself, um, on a, Hey, it's no big deal. It's an out and back hike. I'm going to be done in a couple hours kind of thing. Um, you know, really researching your, your area before you go, even somewhere you've been, many times, but understanding it ahead of time. I think we kind of already talked about that. Um, and then here were some great tips I came across uh, that even in the the aftermath can be helpful. One of them was, hey, leaving a spare set of keys back at your pickup if you are with a partner or even if you're not. 
Um, you know, your, your partner, depending on the situation, I don't know how many times we've gone out where, hey, my buddy's got, got key, the keys to the pickup in his backpack. Well, should he be the one to have a problem? And in the, you know, the heat of the moment, we forget that he's got the keys. A guy could hike all the way out to trailhead needing to drive down to get cell phone service or whatever and may not be able to, which, of course, costs time, right? Um, and then having a more intensive um, emergency kit, sleeping bags, extra gear, um, having that full-on first aid kit with a, with a whole bunch more bandages, dressing, splinting materials that you just simply aren't going to carry on a lot of these hunts, but having that at your pickup truck. Um, you know, cause that's, that's the quickest way, right? I'm, I'm a paramedic. I could get back out if I, my buddy's having a problem or, or I'm having a problem. He can get out to the pickup truck and get back with the things we need most immediately to help stabilize injuries and things like that. Because it's very likely in a lot of these situations, I mean, I, I had contact within three hours. That's, that's not typical in a backcountry situation. Oftentimes it's going to take 12 to 24 hours in many cases to get to you, especially if, um, you know, your call doesn't go out till late in the day, they may not even attempt to start to get to you overnight depending on where you're at what kind of trail system is there it can be pretty interesting that way um and then you know the other big thing that i don't think a lot of us tend to do and this this has more to do with getting lost which i kind of think a lot of the listeners and and myself spend quite a bit of time you know avoiding that right we usually carry gps's maps compass that sort of thing um however but you know turning around often uh when you're in the high country or places you can see and and knowing what your route's going to look like back on the way back to where it is you want to go can be, it can be really helpful um, just in, you know, preventing things like this from happening in the first place. Right. Those are excellent points that, I mean, this is so cliche, but were you the guy who thought that this wouldn't ever really happen to you? Oh, I absolutely. Mean, I mean, I'm thinking, okay, here we have uh, an army ranger sniper, you know, four deployments, uh, it works out in shape. You said you were running half marathons, things like that. Like, you know, relatively young guy for sure. I mean, you have to not, I'm not saying you're cocky or arrogant. I'm saying this from experience. You feel like not invincible, but like, you know, I'm going to be fine. Like this won't happen. No big deal. I carry this stupid stuff because you're supposed to, I'll never need it, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Mark, that's, that's 100% is that I can, I can sit here today and tell you that this was an immensely humbling experience. Um, there were just, there were things and misconceptions I had about, uh, about myself. It doesn't matter how many weights I push around in the gym or how many miles I ran, um, the amount of pain that I was in. And I haven't really, you know, I haven't had major injuries like that. I, I don't know that I could have crawled off that mountain under my own power. I like to believe I can, or I could have, um, and could in the future if I needed to. I'm not, sh- I'm not sure that that's how that would have gone. Um, but I would, I would have told you the day I l- stepped off. Oh, what, you know, what happens if X happens up there? I said, oh, I'll, you know, if no one comes, I'll, I'll find a way off. I'll, I'll live, I'll survive, which may in fact be the case. But, um, you know, lucky for me, I didn't have to try to find that out the hard way. And then you start to ask this question. I asked to myself a whole bunch, and I've asked to my buddies, you know, why. Why continue to go out there unprepared like that? Why go out without the technology that now exists? 20 years ago, you know, I grew up without the internet. That was barely a thing when I was graduating high school. No one had cell phones. And that's part of the problem for me is that I grew up hunting these mountains. As soon as I had a driver's license, I was up there hunting. Well, cell phones weren't an option then. Um, now they are. And now satellite communicators are at a very affordable price for all the other money that my buddies and I spend on tags and gear and rifles and bows and, and all of that. What's another 500 bucks to buy a, a great satellite communicator? And that's, um, you know, peace of mind for my family and friends who know I'm out doing these things. And it's peace of mind for me knowing that should I have a problem or should I come across someone who's having a problem? You know, believe it or not, that's one of the things I've thought about most as a care provider is not me having an issue or even one of my buddies. But what happens when I come across that hiker that's hypothermic or this guy having a heart attack out there? Because, you know, we meet people in the backcountry and I've had this fear of not being able to help them. Well, the best way I can help them and myself, my friends, and all that is to be able to communicate with the the authorities that have the resources that are required to mitigate that kind of a situation. Mm. So what advice would you have for the everyday listener out there who's not a uh, army ranger and professional first responder? I mean, I think, you know, you have some incredible, um, you know, wisdom there and experience there, which has helped us in this episode to hear from it. But for the guys who not only need to maybe carry some more first aid gear or something like an Israeli bandage, but really 
what about the knowledge piece, right? What you carry is only as valuable as what you can do with it. Do you have any sort of resources or anything that you would point folks to in terms of just stepping up their knowledge game a little bit? Well, you know, unfortunately, Mark, I, I don't off the top of my head. Um, you know, honestly, it's not something I, I considered. I've had uh, nothing but um, but training over the past about 10 years of my life now. Um, so I, I kind of take it for granted um, that, uh, that it's just basic things that, uh, that a guy ought to know. That being said, I would imagine that um, with a relatively quick uh, Google search that you're going to come up with, you know, as I did, actually, let me, let me back up. So one of the things I searched trying to find some, some statistics and numbers and kind of delve into this, uh, the topic of, you know, how these things occur, who it occurs to, and, and, you know, kind of what the problem is. I did come across a lot of different resources as far as, um, even just, you know, top 10 list, you know, things to do, uh, things not to do. Uh, there's an array of uh, websites, books, uh, podcasts, all these different things that are dedicated to this subject. The, the information is out there. And, um, you know, mostly it's about just being aware that, um, hey, it can happen to you. It happened to me. Um, and it doesn't much matter, you know, your background, your history, all these, uh, you know, quote unquote, tough things I've done didn't mean a hill of beans when I was on that mountain by myself, you know, um, and it's just taken some time. How much, how much time do all of us spend watching a, a YouTube video on the latest, you know, big bull that just got killed or, you know, how to call an elk that much better or how to spot a mule deer in the right situation, you know, taking, um, taking the same approach to the, the overall planning of, of what it is that you're trying to do, whether that's a short day hunt or the, you know, 10 day trip in Alaska, um, it, it, all these areas can uh, d- deserve a lot of respect and and really require us to sit down and think about what it is we're doing. Right? We live in a modern age, um, and there's a, there's a lot of resources there for us to uh, to be able to to delve out. And I think that uh, paying some attention to that ahead of time is probably my biggest piece of advice. As far as the specific goes, I think, like I said, a Google search can probably uh, turn up a whole bunch, just, you know, survival in the back country. It's amazing what you'll come up with. Yeah. Excellent. So with, uh, with some downtime, let's shift to some positive with some downtime that you've had here. Um, has it made you plan any future hunts that you're excited about? <laughs> Cause I know you're not going to stop. I know you're not going to let this injury keep you down. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, now I'm happy to report my buddy just uh, killed a really nice mule deer in Eastern Montana. Uh, I'm just, just text this morning with a picture. I wasn't able to talk to him unfortunately, cause apparently cell phone service is spotty, but no, absolutely. Um, all the wheels are always turning. We, Planned on going to Alaska next year to hunt caribou. Um, however, uh, the recovery time frame for my knee, uh, just don't want to um, plan something like that without knowing exactly what my health situation is going to be. So looking at uh, we're going to be after the elk again, uh, hunting central Idaho, going to get back into that uh, same area, hopefully. And and then we'll uh, get down to that salmon, salmon area for some mule deer. And then I'm going to try to head to Montana again uh this year for deer and elk as well. So we, uh, the specifics of it don't have exactly figured out, but yeah, I'll be, be staying, staying busy after it. And hopefully September 1st, I'll be back up on that, uh, that mountain with my dog again, just this time with a satellite communicator and a little bit better prepared. Yeah. That's yeah. great. It's great Steve, story. Yeah. Well, yeah. This has yeah. been excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time to share it with us. Well, absolutely. Cool. We can cut it there unless there's uh, anything Steve or Steve that you guys want to want to add in there that we didn't hit. Well, Mark, there is kind of one thing that we didn't or that I didn't talk about as far as um, the when you don't get out uh, and some of the communication yeah. that uh, I just read an article this morning in the doctor's office uh, for the November issue of Field and Stream about a, a guy who's uh, at the end of the article anywhere as of print is still lost in the Oregon wilderness. I uh, forget exactly where. And uh, his family's still out there searching for him. And, uh, you know, many friends, hundreds of people, mostly volunteers go out uh, looking for folks. And one of the things that, you know, a big tough ranger like myself can think, I'll, I'll crawl off the mountain or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make it, I'll survive. That's all fine and great, but you do need to, stop and think about the amount of people that are going to come risk their lives are going to come mm. put, put themselves 
in a poor situation to come try to find you and how much easier you can make that by having the right equipment, by having today's technology to uh, give them a definitive place. They're not searching over, you know, hundreds of miles for days on end. And then, you know, it becomes a, can become a recovery mission. And, you know, it can also bring closure to your family, even if you don't make it or your friend doesn't make it out. If you're able to communicate a last known position, it makes it far more likely they're going to, you know, at least find your remains. And, um, you know, those, those impacts can be, can be far reaching. And I know that that was one of the things I did think about up there is that I wanted help. But I didn't I didn't want everyone coming up on that mountain. You know, I didn't I didn't want everyone that might try to come help me to come because I knew that it was dangerous. And if people weren't um, in the right condition and weren't weren't ready for what was ahead of them up there, that it could be dangerous for them. And that thought I did not I did not like. And it wasn't something I had ever considered um, prior to this, that um, that that's an important thing to think about is how many how many of the folks are going to come after you. And, you know, interestingly enough, my uh, my grandfather uh, loved to geocache. You gentlemen familiar with geocaching? Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that was that was thing he loved to do here as as he got older. And uh, him and my grandmother took off to Mexico about ten days after my uh, my incident. And he went off geocaching by himself. Um, and he did not return. Uh, took them thirty six hours to find his body. And oh. it appears that he had died of a heart attack as far as we're able to determine. But I can tell you, I quickly got a real, um, real strong dose of what it's like to be sitting here waiting on someone who's out in a backcountry area and not knowing and not, you know, not being, not knowing a clue did what, uh, what did happen to him? Where is he? We, you know, we didn't, didn't have his, didn't even have his remains or his body to, to have some closure, which thankfully for us was only a 36 hour wait, but that family in Oregon is still waiting, mm. um, well over a year now. And those are again, things I had never considered, uh, prior to the fact. So it's, uh, it's dangerous out there far more so at times than I think we realize. And there's, there's a, a many things to think about just beyond yourself or just getting yourself out. And I think that's, uh, that's something that I had never, had never really thought about before this. Yeah. I think there's abs- absolutely no reason not to buy a satellite communicator these days. They said there's $300 and you pay your 20 bucks a month and it's, that's worth every single penny. You spend. I mean, yeah, you don't have to, factor in the value of all the money you spent on everything else for hunting it's uh i know i put an in reach in my pack four years ago now and and i think it's the best thing i've ever put in there the, the peace of mind that you have when you go out there whether you're solo or with buddies or whatever it's it's absolutely worth it yeah yeah i mean it's really just selfish to have the knowledge about what you should do and and not act on it and so hopefully we've all heard it yeah. now and hopefully we all know at least not everything we have to do, but some things we should be doing. And so now it's just on us to, to not be selfish and not be stupid and, you know, and to actually act upon it. I couldn't agree more, Mark. Again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. That was episode 104. As always, you can catch previous episodes or more information about this show at exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast. If you're new to the show, be sure that you hit that subscribe button. You can find the podcast in iTunes and Stitcher and many other podcast directories. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, or maybe a story to share with us, contact us by email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. <laughs>